about decentralized music. My name is Haytham. Let me start by introducing myself uh, to give you a little bit of context on who's talking about this topic. I'm a third culture kid. I was born and raised in Morocco. I have some French influence and US also as well. Um, and I've been living around the world for the past two years. The reason I think this is relevant is in these decentralized environments, you have different perspectives coming together and so understanding the need to create like a safe space for, for everybody is very important. I um, also have a background in engineering, worked in Web2 and, and crypto open source. And then obviously I uh, love music. Um, I like to freestyle rap, sing a song. Damn, it got really loud. Um, also want to preface this by saying I'm not an expert. In this. I don't think anybody's an expert in this field. It's rapidly changing, so take anything I say with a grain of salt. Okay, so what's, uh, what's wrong with the music industry right now? Um, so the, the meme right here is, is very funny, but it's actually pretty true. I'm sure people in the audience know at least someone who's a musician and couldn't really make a living off of their music, unfortunately. There's, there's really a plethora of reasons why the music industry is fragmented and kind of inefficient. Uh, but if I had to, to, to say like one kind of key takeaway is just poor mechanism design around the, the creator not getting properly, like not capturing uh, wealth and, uh, and power around the music that, that they're releasing. And there's a variety of reasons why this is happening. Sorry. Um, so back catalog is owned by, by major like three major labels. So 80% of Spotify playlists are controlled by the three major labels. And 7% of Spotify is actually owned by Sony and Universal Music. Um, so they have this control, like this long lasting control. And then there's uh, insane competition. So 60,000 new tracks are released on Spotify every day. And only like 0.2% of, of artists on Spotify make barely above living wage uh, in the US. There's also internet piracy, which we don't talk about enough. So s since 1999, the US economy more than doubled, whereas uh, the, the music industry sales like barely just are, are back to where they were at the physical record time. So this, uh, this graph kind of shows an interesting um, evolution. You can see how it kind of peaked in the 1980s with vinyl, and then peaked again with CDs and cassettes, and then with the internet just plummeted um, with piracy. And then kind of the hope is that it, it, it was already growing back with the digital streaming sales before Web3, and Web3 can potentially make that even better. So how, how can Web3 music uh, help? Um, there's many ways, so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm more aware of the music NFT route. Music NFTs present this, this very low effort uh, additional income stream for musicians, so they already have their audio files and only need to slap uh, them on an NFT to kind of make uh, more, more money with their, with their art. There's also very cool uh, ways we can reimagine music production and kind of consumption. One of, the, one of the examples is the artist fan communities. So for instance, I, I collected some of my favorite artists' NFTs, and thanks to that, I, I have conversations with them, I built a relationship, and I think that's very unique to Web3. And then obviously there's all the, the traditional blockchain NFT advantages like transparency, you know, you can verify that you're somebody's, you've been somebody's fan for 10 years, let's say you've you bought an NFT by Drake like years ago, you can say that you were one of the first people to call the shot that he was uh, going to be big, and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm, I'm basically focused on, on music NFTs at the STEM level. Uh, for people that don't know what STEMs are, I'm going to put this video on to explain it. Unfortunately, there's no sound in the live audience. But the live stream, people are going to hear it. Um, so I'll just play it. Basically, every uh, instrument track you were seeing on Ableton, like the drum and uh, the vocals he's, he's doing, each of those is a stem. So it's basically, it's basically a, piece, a piece of a song. So when you have a song today, and on Ableton usually you have different instrument tracks, each instrument track is called a stem. And we're basically uh, thinking that having stem NFTs is an interesting approach to, to Web3 music. 
because it lets uh, the music be created on chain. So people are using these music building building blocks to kind of create music together. And since it's already on chain, uh, it increases the leverage of uh, Web3 kind of content and will drive users coming to, the, to, to these platforms. Also has some cool side effects like stem level uh, rights attribution. Uh, so you can know, the, you can give credits at the stem level, you can give information on, on the sound file at the stem level. And then there's this cool side effect of a natural rarity hierarchy. So if you think of one of your, fav one of your favorite songs like Seven, Seven Nation Army or a DJ Tiesto song, and you think of the different sounds that you hear, there's probably a sound that you prefer. So if we do a random mint on a sound and you're getting one of the stems, you'll probably have one that you really want to get. And usually it'll be like the main vocal or like, a, you know, the guitar line. Um, and obviously it changes from one person to the, to the next, but it's kind of reminiscent of the PFP kind of rarity uh, of NFTs. So I think it's, it's, it's also an interesting kind of uh, property. Um, so what do we do with these stems? Basically, yeah, the artist, an art, a given artist, uh, let's say DJ Tiesto, because we went with him, takes a song that he has uh, out and drops the stems of that song as an NFT collection. So basically the different instrument tracks. Then we incentivize his fans and our community to make music with those stems. So make new music. So let's say you use one of the snares from that song and you add your own samples and you mix it and master it however you want. And then you make a new song out of that. Um, so then DJ Tiesto can actually approve your song on chain if he likes it and tie the, the, that song NFT back to the stem NFTs that you used from, from him. So basically it's kind of like an on-chain featuring. If you're still with me, I really appreciate it. Uh, it's gonna get a little bit ugly for a bit, but just, just bear with me. So basically what, what, what this is, is a set of smart contracts that represent these entities on-chain. Um, so you have a project creator contract that allows us to um, create new projects. One, a project is one of multiple artists that can then release um, stem collections. So a collection of samples or, or stems that are tied to a specific song are released as NFTs and tied to this project on chain. And then the project releases a song, a collab song contract that other artists or other users can use to mint NFTs that tie back to their stems, to their samples. So basically, you can, you can get their approval on chain for using their samples. You can clear somebody's art and music on chain. Um, maybe you've heard of this uh, paradigm before. We talk of unopinionated protocols and opinionated platforms. So basically, just like the Ethereum blockchain protocol is a set of rules uh, that Ethereum node clients interact with, we have this STEM protocol, which is a set of rules for anybody really to interact with the smart contracts and, and kind of tie pieces of intellectual property or media files together on chain. And then we're developing also this platform called STEMS uh, at STEMS.art, which is a UI wrapper around the STEMS protocol, which is meant to drive uh, network growth. Because uh, uh, really, the, the, like all these, there, there's a lot of protocol, protocols these days, and, and the, I guess like the power, like the measure of power for a network would be the growth rate and, and the size, which are, um, there's two main drivers, in my opinion, for that. Uh, one is like very strong financial incentives. So in the case of layer one, like proof of work mining, um, you can have like a very, very bad UX. Like if you're trying to mine Bitcoin or proof of work Ethereum, it's not a smooth experience. Uh, but because of the in financial incentives, you're still going to join the network and do it. Um, in the case of like the application layer of, of the blockchain, which is where we exist, uh, you really want good UI UX to provide an experience that's actually even better than the alternatives in Web2. So if you think of, of swapping, um, swapping something on Aave for like for swapping like uh, currencies, that experience is a lot smoother than a foreign exchange swap on, uh, in Web2, basically. Um, and and you, know, you can see with this graph that we're still ways, ways uh, it's like very early still. Um, only 200 million Ethereum addresses, that's just, just unique addresses. So probably like 100, 150 million users. And uh, as a kind of Web3 music, its main challenge, in my opinion, is to get all the other people that are using music streaming onto Web3, uh, you know, before even competing with each other uh, and, and such. 
Okay. And just for a closing, uh, kind of closing thought to, to get your minds uh, kind of racing a little bit about this, this space, because um, I, uh, I don't pretend that we've, we've actually uh, nailed how this, this can, can, be, can work at its ideal. It's really like imagining something that's never existed before. Uh, but the challenge is, is, as I described, like the UI UX hurdles. So just sign up authentication is a massive friction point for users, obviously. Like we would get so many more people on our platform if they didn't need a wallet, for instance. So there's some solutions for this, but that sacrifice privacy, unfortunately. And the thing is like, you know, you have 99.5% of cases, your signature goes through, it's pretty smooth, and then 0.5% of cases you're showing somebody at a dinner uh, your app and then they're trying to log in and it takes two hours, just like completely ruined the whole product for, for the entire dinner table. And this, this happens very often. Um, another like more specific to Web3 music issues, it's really unclear what the value of music NFTs is as a speculative asset. You can see the, the graph of, of uh, music NFT sales over time, how it's like kind of flatlining. It is uh, along the lines of visual NFTs as well, but um, definitely shows that we haven't tapped into the, what music NFT technology can unlock besides like speculation, you know, like uh, creating ecosystems around the NFTs and that's kind of what uh, STEMS is, is trying to do. There's also this Web3 native eco ch uh, cha chamber that you find in different uh, sectors or verticals in, in the music space is the same, like, you know, I'm a part of it, I'll support my friends dropping their NFTs and we'll buy each other's stuff and then it's kind of unclear who are the actual new entrants what is the actual real value created uh, that is making people want to buy these, these NFTs? So we kind of need to escape that um, and, and kind of focus on bringing external people onto these, um, onto these ecosystems. And the last one I wanted to touch on, uh, since uh, you know, NFTs are a big part of this talk, you heard me say NFT a thousand times, is, uh, so you've probably all heard of the, the Blur versus OpenSea kind of drama recently where Blur is using a tokenomics approach to incentivize people to use its platform uh, and just slash like, the, the, the fees that you would typically pay on, on NFTs on OpenSea, which then led OpenSea to slash its fee, uh, leading to like, cannibalization of the ecosystem. And it's, it's actually a pretty interesting development because if, if you think about it, Web, the Web3 way is kind of using tokens, so Blur is using tokens to, to do these incentives. Um, and OpenSea is forced to put the user first with that. Um, you know, like cutting the fees really at the end of the day benefits the user. The issue is, you know, Blur is really creating like an early stage uh, majority that will dominate the platform later on. It's like, how do you, how do you make sure that it grows and maintains itself? Um, and we're thinking of like this in the context of our platform, like subscription versus NFT, like access NFTs versus N like files in NFTs, etc. Um, yeah, so that, that's it. There's a couple minutes if I don't know if we're doing questions. How are we doing? Anybody has a wanted to weigh in or has a question? Yes. For in in general, you mean? Yeah. So there's splice. Splice is the dominant like free license uh, stems uh, so software platform. You pay like a subscription fee and then you have access to uh, infinite stems. Um, and then there's play like you can't actually find the stems of songs that you listen to if that's if that's your question. In general, yeah. So Splice would be it. Yeah. And obviously, like uh, our stems art, we have the stems of the specific uh, artist that dropped with us. Yes. You talked about a stem approval, like when you create a new song. What if the artist doesn't want to approve the song you've created with their stem? Yeah, great question. That's the whole point. It's like uh, we don't want to force people to uh, like cr be creatively, you know, partner creatively with someone if they don't want to. So you can't actually mint that song on the blockchain. You can't if it's not approved by the artist. So what, what, what is happening under the hood is you're basically uploading a song to, for the artist to see. And if they like it, they're whitelisting your address to mint an NFT with that smart contract. So if you're not whitelisted, you just can't do it. Yeah. Awesome. That's it. All right. Thank you. Give a big round of applause. Thank you so much.